can say today, I'm also impressed as a Roman. Um, uh, what, we, what we have for you today is um, quite a, um, an action-packed day, if you would like to stay here, because um, uh, obviously there's going, to be the, to, there's going to be the main display starting at 2 o'clock. However, before that we also have quite a lot of other things, including a lecture about um, uh, the daily life in, uh, in the UK, which will take place down in uh, the fort. But before that, we have two little talks for you, if you're interested. One about Roman siege engines, and the other one about Roman food, which will take place over there. And I'm doing both. So obviously, I will try to keep this as brief as possible, in order not to bore you still. Um, if you need to ask any questions, always ask at the end of the delivery, so that obviously, um, uh, you know, I can answer. What you're seeing here is called an onage. In Latin, Onage refers to a donkey, a very stubborn donkey, the one that kicks, you know, with its hind legs, and that's why it's called an onage. The reason is because when this, um, uh, when when the when the main stuff is released, okay, after being tensioned, now I I, I will show you how it works. Um, it gives that kick, and the Romans used to compare that to the kick of a stubborn donkey. And that's how it was named. Now, what you're seeing there is a catapult. Now, we've seen catapults when we were, when we were children. We had toys like this, no? Catapults. And we still sell these things from our shop because they still remain very, very popular. You see catapults in children cartoon uh, movies, for example, and things like that. It is a very ancient form of um, artillery. And in fact, it is used to deliver shells or projectiles up to quite a distance. Now, how do you manage to do it? Obviously, one needs quite a lot of caution. And in Roman times, they had very little means to achieve that, except for using tension rope. And that's what we have done. It is a very, very powerful machine, as you will see. It is also very, very hard in order to cock it as you will see as well. Okay? Now, obviously, we are going to show you how it is done. Here we have um, um, a small artillery team who will, um, who will load the piece, okay, using, obviously, a um, period drill. And um, I will explain all the different stages which are necessary to load and fire this piece. Now, siege engines of this nature had been used throughout antiquity. And they went on being used all the way up to the invention of artillery. When gunpowder was invented in the 14th century, at least in Europe, because probably the Chinese had it even earlier, um, catapults started fading away. Because, of course, the you know, gun um, um, became more efficient to, to deliver projectiles up to great distances. Now, the bigger the size of the catapult, the bigger the range, and the bigger the projectile. What would they deliver? with a catapult of that nature. They could use stone, but they could also use with inflammable materials. And they would explode on hitting the target or the ground. And that's what um, the Romans would use, for example, against like ships. Now, we know for sure that catapults were used both in sieges, laying a siege to a castle, but also in trying to sink ships from a castle. In that case, they would use a combination of both. They would either, either use heavy stone projectiles, okay, by which they would try to penetrate the, the hull of the ship, the deck and the hull of the ship. Or else, they would use inflammatory projectiles. Obviously, we are talking about very early periods, and of course, it's essentially a very ancient form of a cannon. Um, uh, we also use catapults in order to fire smoke grenades or smoke shells in order to gas out an enemy from um, a fortified compound. They also use the form of bacteriological warfare by throwing, using catapult, dead bodies, for example. Okay, for example, it was used here in Malta during the Great Age, but the Turks had used them. And some say the order replied back. <laughs> we weren't there, we don't know, but probably they did. So, you could throw anything. 
okay, dead carcasses, projectiles, I mean, heavy projectiles and such like. Interestingly, some years ago, I was involved in an archaeological investigation um, in uh, a part of Valletta, which is essentially one of the sunken batteries on the uh, left-hand side as you go into Valletta of the main gate. Till fairly recently, there used to be um, a folklore museum in this place. And they were digging the ground and they came across some half-rounded stone projectiles. And everyone, you know, wondered what they were. And one of our theories was that they were catapult, catapult projectiles. Why would you have a half round instead of a full round? Well, it fits better on the later period catapults. Because later period catapults, instead of having a sling, which is this one here, sorry. Okay, you have a sling. This is called a sling. Instead of having a sling, they had a pedal or a scoop in which you could also put small bits of projectiles so that they would shower onto an advancing army, especially the horses. You know, um, at times it was not as much, you know, the, the power of the projectile that would cause the damage, but um, it was the... Um, you know, it was the psychological effect of being showered by an immense amount of projectiles, especially, especially in an open battlefield. You have to keep in mind that they wouldn't have just one, they would have a whole row, and at times successive rows of catapults, each firing up um, over, over the other, depending on, on, the, on the size of the attacking army or the one which is defending. Obviously, we know that the Romans, especially in their, in their high period, you know, were not only wealthy, but they also had essentially all the needs that they required because they had the world's largest empire, which men had ever created. And of course, they had all the resources. Catapults could not just be, um, um, you know, built in an arsenal and then delivered, but they could also be built by the soldiers themselves on site. If you had um, a seasoned or a trained carpenter could very well, you know, build anything like that. So long he knew what was required. What you needed were essentially very sturdy um, um, trunks, okay, from which you would shape these bulks. They would use oak if they could find any, but if they wouldn't find any oak, then they would, they would use um, anything that would come by. <coughs> One thing that you need to realize about this period is that soldiers used to live very, very young and they would return very, very old back home because they would spend most of their adult life literally on campaign. So obviously they would have, they would have no um, possibility of being constantly supplied in the field. All right? That's why officers in particular would be trained in such a way that they could build things like this, okay? Anyway, so what you needed was wood, rope, and iron. Now, you needed iron in order to create something like this, okay? Here you have a windlass, all right? If you come closer, you can see it better. Come, come this way, please. It is not loaded at all. at least it is, um, it's, it is stopped, you know, at 90 degrees. Um, um, here you have the windlass, and over there you have the tension rope. Now, the tension rope, you have, you know, you need to pass many strands around, around the spar, and uh, using these two pieces uh, on the side, okay, turning them against each other, you will create the required tension. Okay, is there anyone who would like to pull it? Come on, volunteers, have a go, try it, try it, you, you, try it. Huh? You, sir? You, have a go, show them how hard it is. Yeah, pull it, pull it from here, not too much. That's what, that's what um, really powered this machine. Now, as I have said before, longer the ranges, bigger the engine. If you need to hit, 
but you know, after a mile, you needed to create quite a monster. In our case, this had cost us quite a lot of money, and it was produced here, okay, by um, this gent here, and there's another gentleman at the far end. And, um, you know, um, in, in, in many cases, we had to build them quite a lot of research, and um, we also visited um, other locations to make sure that it would work. Um, uh, so, uh, what, you, what you have is what you see. Now, a very important thing is, is this paper. Okay? On this side, you can see... Oops. Robin, here's that. Hello? You see? The windlass... The, the windlass is, is needed in order to, um, to coil the rope. And by doing that, we'll be using the levers, obviously, we'll pull this back. And that way, we'll, we'll pocket. it. And of course, you'll have the required tension and hurl a piece. We'll be firing this, okay? It is intentional to be made from paper, because we don't want to kill anyone. But we also have some weight, okay? Now you will see how far it will go. Now, the fact that it is not as heavy as it should be, obviously the range is impaired. Okay, because if it is heavier, it would go even farther. But obviously for, for uh, security reasons and also because we would like to keep um, uh, you know, a very friendly, friendly relationship with our neighbor here. <laughs> All right, we're not, we will not use it. Um, okay, now, if you move back, we'll, we'll do um, uh, the drill and we'll load it and fire it. Afterwards, if you're interested, um, uh, we're also offering the opportunity to any one of you who would want to have a go at it, okay? Um, anyone doing it will give you one of these as well. But we're also asking for a donation, okay? A donation of 10 euros. That has cost us almost 2,000 euros and we're trying to pay for it now. Okay, so if there's anyone who would want to help us, okay, you'll get the opportunity. We'll only fire three times, not more, okay? So anyway, first, um, go over there so that you will see it, okay? On that side, please. And any artillery team would do is to take post by the engine. And you will see that they are all lined up, ready to take their positions. In a military organization, everything has to be done in a predetermined way. And not just, each one of them has to be thoroughly trained in order to achieve the highest level of efficiency. And that way, of course, one would fire as fast as was required. Okay? The process is laborious and it's a little bit too slow by our modern standards. And you will see it now. Julian. Ballistari! Man! Data! Scorpius! Bear! Barat! Okay? The ones who would, who would fire this piece would be called Ballisteri. Ballisteri is essentially equivalent to um, um, uh, to um, artillerymen, okay? These days we would call them gunners, at least in English. Um, uh, but obviously the, the Romans would call them ballisteri. Why? Because they, did, they didn't have a bombard yet. And then eventually they became, in, middle, in the Middle Ages, artillerymen were called bombardiers, for example, and eventually gunners. But of course, bombards and guns did not exist yet. So of course they would be called ballisteri. You see, they are cranking up the windlass in order to load the machine. Now imagine a bigger engine, you know, how hard it would be in order to load it. Now it is at full tension, all right? It has been completely wound and um, it is ready to fire, okay? Now we're going to give the order, by the way, to fire, to fire the piece. Sorry, one should never cross that way. <laughs> <coughs> to fire the piece, there is a lanyard here, which is this rope. You see? And here you have a catch. 
when you pull when you pull that rope the um, um, the arm is released and of course it hurls the um, you know the projectile up to the target okay Now together, yeah? we're going to count from three to zero, and then shout, huh? fire. So let's start counting. Three, three two, two, one, again! Two, one.